So my talk is going to be about, about the data as well as how you analyze the data. And it's more about the analysis of the data. So you've probably seen this before. This is the TCGA main web page. And if you click on Launch Data Portal, that's where you see all the, uh, the huge amounts of data that's already there. And if you go to Download Data, and well, let's see. These are all the samples that are there. Available cancer types, number of patients with samples, downloadable tumor samples, and so on. So if you actually look at a data matrix, I'll just show you a quick example. So you go to data matrix. And just GBM, all I'm going to do is hit apply for just GBM. It's taking its time to load. There's a reason for that. The data is huge. Okay, well, I guess this makes my point. The data is huge. <laughs> so the bottom line is with such, there you go. So this is just for one tumor type. And you can see all the A's, that's like data for one sample. So you can see uh, one sample, one platform. These are all platforms going from left to right. You have your clinical data, your gene expression data, your exon expression, microRNA, copy number, methylation, SNP, uh, trace data, somatic mutations, ex protein expression, and RNA-seq data. And then you have so many different samples, you know, approximately 500 or more sometimes. And this is just for one tumor type. So you can imagine how overwhelming this can quickly get for your average biologist or clinician or translational researcher. Now for computer scientists, for bioinformaticians, for biostatisticians, uh, it may not be that bad because we're used to getting more data, analyzing it using custom tools. Um, but every time you need to answer a specific question, you need to design a specific tool or you need to write customized software for that. So the question th that was uh, posed was, and the challenge that was there for certain institutions called GDACs, which are Genome Data Analysis Centers, they were chartered in TCGA, they were chartered with the, um, uh, with the express mandate that they should create tools which allow the community of researchers to investigate this data in a meaningful way and get more, more information out of this, out of this huge mess that if you look at, you just get overwhelmed. So um, the GDACs, there are about seven GDACs, including MD Anderson, where I'm from. So MD Anderson is in Houston. Uh, so you can see when I came out this morning, I, I ended up wearing a jacket, whereas Jay, who's from Ohio, just came out with a plain shirt and said, complained that it was too hot. <laughs> so that's the difference between Texas and Ohio. <laughs> so uh, we have about seven GDACs, and those GDACs have produced many different online tools. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a snapshot of some of those tools. Now, there are a lot of tools available. I don't have time to go through all of them in detail. But here's what you can do. This is what I do. You go to Google, you type in TCGA tools. The first link that comes up, analytical tools, that's the TCGA page. Now you can get to this through the main page as well, but I just find it more convenient to do it this way. Anyway, so when you get to the tools page, this is a list of existing tools that the GDACs have produced. The, we have produced this particular tool called MBatch, but I will get to that in a bit. Now, I just want to show you screenshots of some of these tools. So for instance, we have the IGV or Integrated Genomics Viewer from the Broad Institute. This is a very popular tool used by a lot of people. Um, then we have another tool, of course, you, many of you must have uh, heard of this, the UCSC Genome Browser, Cancer Genome Browser. So we've got that as well. Then we've got Firehose, which I'll talk about in more detail. We've got another tool called Regulome Explorer. This is from Institute for Systems Biology in Seattle. And then uh, we have tools produced by MD Anderson. Uh, and again, I'll talk about those two. What I will focus on is just two or three tools so that you guys have an idea of what these tools are capable of. 
You can get more information by looking at this page, reading through the descriptions of each of these tools, going to the respective pages and looking at the documentation about how to use those. <clears throat> so let me start off with uh, the CBIO portal. So this is a tool called CBIO that's produced by Memorial Sloan Kettering. And this is, a, is I, I think this is an amazing tool. It's an amazing portal. So what this tool does or what this portal does is it takes all the data and then it distills it down into simple summary results. So for instance, and, I, and my workshop is about this tool too. So for instance, when you, here's the page to go to it. cbioportal.org, if you just go there. Then um, for those of you who have laptops, you can follow along with me if you like. Then this is the page that comes up. And what we have here is you can select your study. So when you click on the drop down list, you're gonna see all the different tumor types that are available on this tool. So you get breast cancer, colorectal cancer, glioblastoma, and so on and so forth. Now on some of them, you'll have two entries. For example, glioblastoma. That's because, um, as many of you know, TCGA has published what are called marker papers for each of the tumor types, and they're in the process of publishing marker papers for the others, and Jay uh, talked about that during his presentation. So if you are looking at just the data for, from the marker paper, then you're gonna click that link. So for example, uh, glioblastoma multiform data from the marker paper, you're gonna click this link. This paper was published in Nature in 2008. And then if you wanna look at all of the data to date that has been uploaded to CBIO in GBM, then you click on the second link which says TCGA provisional. Uh, there are some uh, you know, uh, tumor types in which the marker paper is not yet out, for example, kidney. For those, you will just see one entry. And kidney paper is about to be uh, published pretty soon. So what kind of analysis do these marker papers have? You know, what kind of analysis can you expect to see? So let me move on to the slides. Some common analysis types that you can expect to see in the marker papers are subtype discovery. So subtypes based on mRNA, microRNA, DNA methylation, protein and copy number, for instance. Outcome prediction, survival. Pathway alterations, copy number profiles, cross tumor comparisons, and many others. Uh, some of these were published, for example, in the ovarian cancer paper that was published uh, back in 2011. And since then, we've had many more papers, such as the colorectal paper, the breast cancer paper, the lung uh, squamous paper, and so on. So I'm just going to flip through a few examples to give you an idea of the kinds of analyses that we as bioinformaticians uh, do on these kinds of data sets. <clears throat> so this is an example of subtype discovery. Four subtypes were found based on mRNA expression. What you see here is a heat map. So here you have these uh, tumors, and uh, what you have are all of these samples. You have samples over here and samples over here. All of these samples have been classified into four different uh, clusters. And then they were compared in another data set, and similarly four clusters were found in the other data set as well. So TCGA and the other data set, you know, they matched up, which is good news. And then uh, uh, microRNA-based subtypes were also found. So this is microRNA-based clusters. So clustering is one example of the analysis that we do. And then once you find the clusters, you find, okay, what clinical variables are associated with that? Uh, do patients that fall into one cluster do uh, better or worse than the other patients? What kind of genes are altered in those uh, clusters? And so on and so forth. So pretty detailed analysis, and you're welcome to look at the papers uh, for more information if you like about those clusters. And then we have outcome predictions. So this is using ovarian gene expression data. And you can see that there was a TCGA, um, you know, part of the TCGA data was used for training purposes. The rest of it was used for testing purposes. So you have one set, another set, another set, another set. So you have four, four different sets. And uh, they show a gene signature was identified using the training set. And then that gene signature was applied to these four different sets. And you see differences in outcome based on that. So this is another type of analysis that is commonly done. This is for microRNA data, and again, you see one of them, one of the clusters stands out from the rest. You also have pathway alterations. So you look at, okay, from among all the patients, you know, which genes are modified, which genes, you know, have copy number elevations or deletion, amplifications or deletions, 
and so on. And I'll talk about this more as I illustrate uh, the tools. So this is uh, uh, another, uh, this, this is called OncoPrint. I'll talk about that when I get back to the C bio portal. Then there are copy number uh, alterations. Here you see a map where it shows uh, these are the genes and it shows amplifications in a certain region of the genome. This is chromosome one, chromosome two, chromosome three, and so on and so forth. Um, and then uh, these are deletions. So on the, on the left-hand side, the red ones are amplifications, regions of amplifications, and these are regions of deletions in the cohort of patients. And then uh, now we're doing cross-tumor analysis as well, so pan-cancer analyses. So this shows you, this is an interesting figure that was included in the ovarian paper. This uh, shows chromosomes from 1 all the way down to 22, and it shows you copy number alterations where red means amplified and blue means deleted. So you can see that GBM has far fewer copy number alterations than ovarian cancer. So all of this is ovarian cancer, and all of this is GBM. But GBM has uh, uh, large amplifications in chromosome 7 and deletions in chromosome 10. So by looking at, TC one of the powerful things about TCG is you can compare not just within a tumor type, but across tumor types as well. So looking at this figure, one would say that ovarian cancer is uh, driven in large part by copy number alterations, because almost the entire genome is altered in copy number. And these are samples going from left to right, by the way. Uh, and what we found was that there are very few genes that are mutated in ovarian cancer. So, you know, the, the theory that's building up is, okay, it's more copy number driven than mutation driven, as opposed to GBM. So GBM has quite a few mutations in several genes, so that may be pr more predominantly uh, mutation driven. Okay, so now I'll move on to the demo and continue from where I left off. So here, um, for example, you can select, let's say, um, colon. So I will go with colorectal adenocarcinoma. This was a paper that was published uh, recently. And when you go down, you can, let me scroll up a little bit. So the first step you do, you select your tumor type. The next step you do is you select your genomic profiles. <coughs> so if you're looking at mutations, or do you want to look at copy number, do you want to look at mRNA expression, and then uh, in some cases you also have protein expression. So right now let's look at mutations and copy number alterations. Now you can select a subset of the patients that are there, or you can select all of the patients that are available. So let's select all of the patients that are available. And then in gene set, you have two options. Either you can enter your own genes that you want to look at, or you can use predefined list. So if you go to the drop-down box, you're going to see a predefined list. And in that, you can choose any pathway, for example, P53 pathway. So what that'll do is it'll populate the list uh, with the genes that fall within that pathway. And then if you hit submit, now remember we selected mutation and copy number as our uh, platforms. When you hit submit, it's going to go ahead and look at colorectal cancer, and it's going to find all the mutations and copy number aberrations in those genes that you entered. So this is what is called an oncoprint. So this oncoprint, the way you interpret it is, going from left to right, each column represents a single sample. If you mouse over it, you can see the sample ID. So as I mouse over it, you can see which sample is altered. Then, so within this patient, which is TCGA AF3400, within this patient, you have an amplification of CDKN2A. That red bar means amplification. And you have a deletion of CDKN2A in this patient, AA3517. So you have different patients. One of them is amplified, one of them is deleted. So blue bars means deletion, red bars mean amplification. The green buttons, they represent mutations. So here you see that CDKN2A hardly has any mutations or has no mutations. Let me scroll all the way. Yeah, so it has no mutations whatsoever. But it does have alterations in 3% of the samples. MDM2, on the other hand, has mutations in only 1% of the samples. MDM4 has mutations in 2%, and P53 has mutations in 52% uh, and deletion in actually one of them. And yeah, so it doesn't have any more alterations. So this gives you an idea of the landscape of copy number aberrations as well as mutations across the cohort of patients. Now, if you were to do this by hand using TCGA data, it would not be easy at all. 
So for example, copy number data, uh, the data itself is organized in such a way that you don't get gene names, you get segments. So you get, okay, chromosome three, starting at base pair number one million and two, up to one million and ten, you know, that segment is amplified by a factor of, I don't know, uh, one. So you have one extra copy number there. So things like that you're going to see, and you're going to see that these segments across the entire genome for one sample, all right? So it's your job then to, number one, translate that genome to a gene location, right? That segment to a gene location. <clears throat> That's one. Two, think about copy number and what it means. So copy number is one of the more messy data sets out there because let's say you have a tumor sample. Now, they're not all heterogeneous, you know? I mean, they're not ho all homogeneous. These are heterogeneous tumors, so some of the cells might have double the copy number, so instead of two copies, it has four copies. And some of the cells might have no copy number changes. So let's say you have, I don't know, 70% of the samples have four copies, 70% of the cells in the sample have four copies, and 30% have a normal copy number of two. When you get a number, an average of that, you will get a number that's between two and four, you know, for copy number. So you're left scratching your head and you're thinking, if you're not familiar with what's going on in the background, you'll think, wait a sec, how can a patient have like 3.5 copy number, you know? Um, and in one segment, you'll have one copy number, in another segment, you'll have another copy number. So working with that data is not easy. That's why all of this analysis has been done and these tools have been produced. So what they do is they do all of this hard labor and legwork for you. So now you can simply say that, okay, in patient AF3400, CDKN2A is amplified, you know? So they've pre-cooked your meal for you. All you gotta do is take it out of the microwave and eat. So I think that's pretty neat. So you have a bunch of tabs that, pull, that are shown over here. And by the way, these are um, basic uh, summary, summary tables. So you can see which of the mutations in P53 are missense, nonsense, frame shift, and all that. So if you look at the tabs on top, you will see, one, you will see the network itself. <clears throat> so that's the network of the genes that were selected and how the genes are connected to other genes. That's the entire network and it's interactive. And then you can look at survival plots, um, box plots, survival plots. So these are box plots. These are box plots of P53. Uh, this is, uh, <clears throat> you know, with the putative copy number alterations from GISTIC. Now, what is GISTIC? That's one of the modules that have been produced by the Broad GDAC. So GISTIC is a tool that allows you to convert that copy number data into this gene level amplified versus deleted calls. I think it's pretty neat. And then uh, you have survival. So it tells you that in those patients in which the gene was altered versus uh, in those patients in which these genes were not altered, is there a difference in survival? And in the workshop uh, that, for, that is after this, the exercises, we will do some exercises and look at some of these examples. Is this looking at all four genes or, or? All four. So the gene set altered, that's alteration in any one gene of the four that you selected. And there are mutual exclusivity tables, so they tell, they tell you, you know, P53 and CDKN2A, 2 MDM2, MDM4, uh, whether they are altered in a mutually exclusive or a co-occurring way. So mutually exclusive is when you see uh, an alteration in one, but n almost never an alteration in the other, and vice versa. And I'll give you a good example of mutual exclusivity in the exercises. So in this case, these are p-values. So in this case, we see MDM4 and MDM2, they have a tendency towards co-occurrence. This is the legend right there. So um, if you have an alteration in MDM2, you have an alteration in MDM4. And then you have event map, um, tells you, you know, if there's a mutation, what kind of mutation, and so on and so forth. This is the, the table of mutations of so P53. Each of these red dots represents a mutation uh, in this cohort of patients. So you can see where the hotspots are in the P53 uh, gene. And then this is a table that gives you more details. So in this particular sample, in this particular patient, uh, this is a amino acid change. Here's the type of mutate mutation. This is a mis missense mutation. And then you have some other parameters uh, that deal with that. So you can look at this entire table uh, and go through that. And similarly, you have mutations in MDM4, MDM2, um, and that's it, because of CDKN4 did not have um, any mutations. CDKN2A did not have any mutations. 
So, <clears throat> and you can download the data as well if you want to. And you can hook up to IGV. So this is a new trend that is starting now, relatively new, in which all the GDACs, all these seven GDACs, they have their own tools and they're saying, okay, how about we let these tools communicate with each other? That'd be really neat. So that's what's happening now. And IGV that you see here, that is hooked up to CBIO portal. So IGV is from Broad, CBIO is from MSK, but still they are uh, collaborating with each other and they're hooking up. So we also plan to do that with our tools. Now, let's go to another uh, tool. This is the Firehose tool. So if you go back to this page, and then let's just click on the Firehose link. So Broad GDAC Firehose. So you end up over here as your main page. Now you're on the Broad website. Here you have, so what, what is Firehose? Firehose is actually a pipeline that runs many different analysis modules that have been provided to Broad from different institutions. Some of them uh, are created by Broad themselves. Some of them are provided by different GDACs. We also have provided our module to Firehose. So what happens is that Firehose is able to integrate all of these modules, all of these analysis tools, and then produce reports based on the data. So every month, Firehose takes all the data that is available in TCGA and then runs these modules on them and gives you the outputs, produces these reports, and that's what's published over here. So on the left-hand side, you see the data, and on the right-hand side, you see the analysis results. So let's look at some of the analysis results. So if I go to, for example, um, I don't know, endometrial, UKEC, and here, you're going to see the date of the runs, the prior runs. <clears throat> so approximately every month, there's a new run. This was on uh, December uh, 21st, was the second last run. The latest run was on January 16th, 2013. So if you look at this and you say, okay, let me go to endometrial, this is what comes up. So here, you have the results of the analysis. So if you're looking at sequence and copy number analyses, if you're looking at clustering analyses, so if you look at copy number and mutation, these are your reports. So let's take, let's take a look at mutation, for instance. So we click on view report. So this mute sig analysis produces this page, and then if you want to look at, let's see, significantly mutated genes, you're going to see this table, and it tells you that in endometrial cancer, NPAT tells you the number of patients. About 161 patients had P10 mutations. And then uh, 132 had PI3 kinase mutations, pig 3 ca mutations. So these are, so P10 is the most mutated gene in this cohort of endometrial cancer patients. Then PI3 kinase is the next, arid one a P53, FGFR2, and so on. So this is an order, right? Um, it'll tell you the list of most significant genes there are about 35 and it goes down to 18 patients and I think there were about 300 or so uh, samples if I remember correctly in excess of 300 samples in the whole cohort. So only 18 of those had these uh, mutations. So beyond 35 you're probably going to find mutations as well but the frequency of those mutations was too low for it to show up in this particular table. So if, you ask a if you're a clinician and you want to ask the question, okay, which is the most frequently mutated gene in any one disease, you would go to Firehose. Okay? Similarly, if you want to look at copy number data, you'd say, okay, uh, which is the most significantly amplified or deleted region in endometrial cancer? So if you view the report, so this is GISTIC, like I mentioned, which converts all that copy number data into amplified versus deleted calls for the genes. And the report has taken a while. Click again. So, and then you have, <clears throat> so you have sequence of copy number uh, results. You also have clustering analysis results. You have correlation analysis results. And you have other analysis like pathway analysis and so on. So you, it's, it's quite a rich data set. I don't know what happened here. So, I don't know what happened, but uh, I guess the report isn't coming up, but that's okay. So this is Firehose, and this will let you uh, get results for different pieces of analysis, and we're gonna work on Firehose as well in the next session. 
Okay, <clears throat> moving on. So I will take this opportunity to shamelessly show you a tool that we have developed that is coming down the pike. It's, uh, it's, it's there in development right now. It's very close to being uh, published. Uh, we've uh, had talks with the journal Nature and uh, they have, uh, you know, they've asked us, in fact, to license the software, and we've given this software to them. Um, so these, so this tool is for, <clears throat> excuse me, this tool is for next generation clustered heat maps. So I'm glad all of you are familiar with heat maps. What this tool does is allows you to dynamically navigate and browse through these heat maps. So what I'll do is I'll play a five minute video, and uh, that'll give you an idea of what this tool does. Genome Atlas Project, Next Generation Clustered Heat Maps. More about that in, in a little bit. The first thing you're going to see is a heat map from the Breast Cancer Project. Across the top are the sample labels. Down the vertical axis are genes. We're zooming on that image using a Google Maps-like tiling technology, uh, zooming some more. Once we've zoomed enough, the labels for the genes on the right-hand side uh, for samples partially off-screen at the bottom. Additional zoom back to, toward the original image. You can see a navigator at the upper right. Fit view takes us back to the entire initial image. Ribbon view, on the other hand, shows it as a long uh, ribbon on which we can navigate to see the genes in their totality while still having enough resolution uh, to explore the genes one by one. To the right is a set of image details under the navigator. Now putting in a gene as a search term, this is ESR1, which is shown on the image. Proceeding to ESR1, it's possible then to interrogate uh, the label for various kinds of information. In this case, we can search for PubMed, but we're going to search in gene cards for all of the kinds of information one would want to have on that gene or on the protein that it produces or on the functions of the gene. We now choose a particular cluster. Uh, this one corresponds to one of the major breast cancer types as shown by the bar at the top. Having zoomed on the region for ESR1, we can then choose a label for a particular sample, get information that's publicly available in that sample, or in this case to link out to CBIO or other kinds of information that are pertinent to that particular sample. view gets us back to the original image. And now we can select a set of genes using the cluster tree uh, for the genes, link out to various kinds of information, including the pathways of, in which those genes, in this case a set of 73, of which 10 are shown, are found. They are sorted according to pathways which have the most of those genes in them. Pathways are similarly sorted according to genes. Can also link out to ideograms of the chromosomes, not yet um, interactive, but they will be, and we plan link outs to the UCSC genome browser as well. Here's a second kind of image. This is gene versus gene, also from the Breast Cancer Project. It is correlation coefficients, red high positive correlation, green high negative correlation. Again, we can choose a particular cluster and zoom on it. Back to fit view, back to the original. Now we can also choose a set of genes uh, by a drag <coughs> procedure and zoom on that set showing <coughs> the gene labels. This is of course symmetrical since it's gene versus gene. Can link 
uh, to, to various sorts of overlays. In this particular case, it's a curated set of first order interactions among genes, or more properly, uh, the proteins coded by those genes, where you see green that indicates literature that substantiates those interactions. In this case, there are two references uh, for that pair of genes on the off diagonal. One can look at uh, various layers. In this case, the p-values are more correctly the log, negative log p-values of the correlation coefficients in the matrix and toggle back and forth among various uh, images using switch data. Here we see again the p-values toggle back and forth so that we can tell what the robustness statistically of each of the patches of color is that we're seeing in the original uh, clustered heat map. We then can interrogate uh, particular pixels in the heat map, in this case showing a scattergram which leads to the correlation coefficient between uh, the genes. It's not yet interactive, but it soon will be so that one can mouse over a particular data point and show it. Correlation coefficients by, and their p-values and, and confidence limits are calculated by a fast bootstrap algorithm. This is then the distribution of bootstrap parameter estimates. Back uh, using fit view to the original diagram, one can then recolor the diagram either using the spectrum or with canned examples uh, that, are, uh, that are stored by the user or that are defaults for the system. Here's a new color scheme. Very important, we can produce high resolution PDFs suitable for publication meeting the criteria for Nature and other, uh, and other of the major uh, publications. Included with the PDF are all of the properties needed to reproduce it at a later time. And similarly, for the image itself, all of the metadata are collected and shown here, involving the build history for the program, the data sources, etc. This is, again, uh, an important element of reproducibility uh, for the images, which very often are hard to trace if one doesn't have that sort of information encoded. Again, choosing one of the color schemes, the original one, the red, green, black. Now, this, in a sense, is simply a first order way of accessing the data and patterns in the data uh, for gene expression, for methylation, uh, for uh, sequence identification and so forth. But we think of it as an interactive exploratory environment increasingly to be linked uh, with uh, browsers at the genome level uh, with other kinds of information, for example, in CBIO. Hope you uh, enjoyed this, uh, this small introduction. Not all of the features that you see in this video are yet publicly available. They're so far on our development server, but within the next months uh, we hope to have them available for TCGA and potentially uh, if selected for ENCODE and other major projects uh, as well. So that was, uh, like I said, a sneak peek of the tool that we have developed and that's coming down the pike. This video was developed for the Nature Editors uh, because they wanted to look at the features of this as I said, they are licensing uh, the software for TCGA, uh, especially the pan-cancer work. Um, I am one of the principals, as you saw, John Weinstein, whose dulcet uh, tones you heard. Uh, he's our department chair, and we also have uh, Bradley Broom, David Kane, and Chris Wakefield. These are the people um, that have uh, helped us put together uh, this entire effort. So the idea behind clustered heat maps, next generation clustered heat maps, is eventually people will be able to create their own clustered heat maps too. But for now, we are using TCGA data. We are compiling a compendium of these clustered heat maps for all possible tumor types and all platform, <clears throat> excuse me, and all uh, platforms, including RNA-seq platform, microRNA platform. So this is in the works right now. It's not yet public. When it will be public, you will see it posted at this particular uh, page on TCGA. So stay tuned for that one. Incidentally, uh, John Weinstein, uh, our department chair, 
he is uh, credited as being one of the inventors of, or the, I guess, principal inventor of clustered heat map and its applications in the bio bioinformatics domain. He first published that in, in, the, in the journal Science in 1992. And subsequently, I think in 1997, it was also uh, published and uh, this was used for um, making a decision on, uh, I think it's called oxaliplatin. I'm not a clinician, so, but it's, it's a drug. It's a drug that was uh, used for cancer. It came out of the NCI-60 project, um, and then clustered heat mass were instrumental in making a decision whether or not they want to use this uh, as a chemotherapy drug. And it was subsequently approved by FDA for use. So clustered heat maps, you know, they become very ubiquitous, as you know. And, uh, you know, I would say, I guess, 90% of the papers, maybe, maybe less, maybe more, 90% of uh, cancer-related papers have at least one clustered heat map somewhere uh, if you look at uh, their analysis. I might be exaggerating that number a little bit, but you know. So, um, so that's why we wanted to invest in clustered heat maps, and hopefully you're gonna find this uh, very useful once it's out. So now I'll move on to uh, the last tool for uh, this session, and that's the uh, MBATCH tool that uh, Jay had also mentioned to earlier. So now all of this data is generated in batches. So when the data is generated in batches, then um, I'm sure you guys know, you can have what are called batch effects. And batch effects are technical variations that you see in the data that are due to the fact that these batches were processed at different times and sometimes at different locations as well. They're not actual, and they're not due to actual biology that we are interested in. They are side effects. So the question is, before you do any analysis, you need to look for batch effects because if you have batch effects in the data and then you do the analysis, you say, you say okay, I'm gonna do clustering analysis. You, let's say, have two batches, you do clustering analysis and you end up with two major clusters and you're gonna be happy, you're gonna be like, oh, okay, you know what, I've discovered something new. So for example, in ovarian cancer data, I've discovered two different clusters and they're two different patients. But guess what? what? The differences that you're seeing are batch effects. They're not due to actual biology, so your results might be skewed and you know, uh, the, any paper that you might publish, the reviewers are gonna chew you up because they were like, okay, come on, where, you know, where's the batch effect analysis? So what we have done at MD Anderson is uh, we have made these tools that allow you to detect and diagnose batch effects in any data set. So this is the main page. So again, going back to, um, oops, going back to this page, if you go to MBatch, that's the tool that we have. That'll give you this main page right there, which I've already pulled up here, okay? When you go to this main page, there are two things. There's documentation there, which you're, you, know, you can read on your own time. But these two buttons allow you to do the following. We have an R package called MBatch. You can download that R package if you wanna analyze batch effects in your own data and if you want to assess batch effects and even correct batch effects in your own data set. So you can use this package. However, we have pre-canned analysis for TCGA batches and that's this button right there. So when you click on that, you will end up with a website that looks like this. So what we have here is we try to do periodic runs of the data. So in this dropdown, you're gonna see periodic runs and the last run is in the process right now. It'll be uploaded soon as well. And then you select the disease type that you're interested in. So over here, I've selected kidney but you can select whatever disease that you like. And then whatever platform that you like, DNA methylation, microRNA, or whatever. So in this case, I've selected DNA methylation. And then the, the center of the platform generating that data. So you have a 27K platform and you have the 450K platform. The 27K platform is the older one that has 27,000 DNA methylation probes. And then a newer one that, has, that is a 450K platform that has 450,000 um, DNA methylation probes, almost half a million. So you can select whichever platform you like. In this case, the 27K has been selected. And then you can select level. We only have level three data at this point because that's the most commonly used level as well. So in TCGA, you have what are called levels of data. Level one data is the raw data that's coming out. So you have probe level data, um, you know, or the raw reads that are coming out of sequencers. Then you have level two data, which is probe set level data. And then level three data, which is gene level data. So most people, they don't work at the probe level or the read level, they like to work at the gene level. So most people are gonna download level three data. So that's what we have over here, level three data. 
And then uh, you can select either the original data set or we have batch corrected data sets. So every, all of these data sets, you have already pre-batch -correct, pre corrected uh, data. However, we are doing this correction blindly in one sense and that it's an automated algorithm, so it's always gonna produce corrected data. My recommendation is if you don't need corrected data, don't use corrected data, use the original data if you don't see batch effects. Right? And I'll, I'll explain a bit how, how do you assess that. And then we have many algorithms. Right now we have clustering, PCA, we have supervised clustering and other algorithms as well. So looking at PCA and then looking at batch type, you know, you can, you can categorize these samples by batch or by tissue source site or by their ship date or by their plate ID. So this is the category that you choose. So this is, let's say, plate ID. And then we want to compare all of them against all of them, many to many, or you can want to compare one batch against many batches. So in this case, this is the DNA methylation data. And this data shows, so basically this is a PCA plot. How many of you are familiar with PCA plots and have seen those before? Okay, a few of you. So PCA plots, you can think of that as they summarize, so each point represents a single sample. And the value assigned, the PCA com principal component analysis, that's what PCA stands for. And it has these components, components one, component two, component three, they are mathematical values, they are, num they are numbers that summarize each data point in such a way that the first principal component, it, it will take a, a combination of the genes that are in that sample in such a way and give them weights in such a way that uh, most of the variation in that sample is explained by that particular principal component. Then the second principal component will serve to explain some of the remaining variants in that sample. And the third one will explain even less variance and less and less and less so on and so forth. So the first few components will end up explaining most of the variation that you see between the samples, right? It's a linear combination of the genes. So that's a very brief, very quick intro to PCA. But what we have done, the novelty here is that when you, when you take a sample, we take these samples, let me go to, for example, um, prostate, so that'll give you a better idea. Prostate and RNA-seq. Okay. So here, all of the samples in one batch have been connected by lines and a centroid or the average value has been generated. That's what you see over here. And then you have the other batch and another batch and another batch and so on. These are the batches right here. What we see here in prostate cancer RNA-seq data that this batch, which is batch number 108 with 13 samples in it, it stands out from the rest. It is distinct from the rest. This is the centroid for that batch. These are the three centroids for the other batches, the color, the, the solid uh, uh, shapes that you see. So what we conclude then is that that one batch is suspected of having some batch effects. This value, DSC right here, it quantifies that batch effect that suspected batch effect. If the value is close to zero, that means there are no batch effects. If it's close to 0.3 or above, some batch effects. 0.5 or above, major batch effects. One and above, oh, you need corrected data, definitely. So, so this is an idea, this is a way in which you can assess batch effects. And if you do find batch effects, you can download corrected data. So you can go to related documents, and then you can download, well, Actually, this is the original, so I'll have to go to corrected by batch ID, and then go to related documents, and then I can download the batch corrected data. Just click here and download selected files, but it's two gigabytes, so I don't think we have enough time to download it right now, which I won't do. So uh, here you can see after batch correction, this um, batch number 108 with 13 samples in it, now it coincides with all the other batches. So it's been brought together, right? Now that can be a good thing. In other words, you're removing the variation between the batches. That can be a good thing if that variation was a technical variation. But if it was a biological variation, then you have a problem. Unfortunately, there's no way of distinguishing, you know, that I know of at least, of distinguishing a genuine biological variation from a technical var variance. What we can do is we can attempt to randomize the batches so that you have, you know, if one batch has samples from multiple tissue source sites, multiple stage, multiple grade, you know, so you can try to randomize them so that you can try to minimize the variation due to biology and focus just on the variation due to the batches. 
It's not always been done in TCGA, but we certainly try. So the thing is, is it easy? Um, not the easiest, but we've tried to make it e as easy as we can. So one thing that we can do is, so if you want to look at, okay, let me look at the same samples, the same PCA plot, but this time from a tissue source site, uh, source site perspective. So here we see that this tissue source site stands out. You know, this is Roswell Park. Okay, so maybe there's something special about that. You know, why is it standing out? So we see effects like this on and off uh, in TCGA, and then if you say, okay, this one sample, you know, it's it's standing out. This one sample right there. What's so special about that? So you can clear this, mouse over this, and you will see the sample ID for that. The tissue source size is um, HC. And then uh, you have PCA components, batch ID, ship date, and so on. But here's the sample ID. What you can do then is you can go back to the TCGA data, look at the clinical parameters, and say, is there anything special about that sample? You know? So this uh, website allows you to easily search for batch effects before you do your analysis so that your analysis is not plagued by uh, batch effects. Right? So let me give you a quick example in the four minutes that I have left for this session. And I'll give you an example of, this is the kidney example that I've shown before to, uh, in uh, other presentations. So we're working in kidney cancer. We looked at the DNA methylation data. And this is what the PCA plot looked like. So you, you, you see a dichotomy here. You see samples up there and down there. But the dichotomy does not correspond to batches. You know, you don't see differences in the batches. Something else is going on. But you see a dichotomy there. They're not all spread out evenly, right? So we investigated that, just like you had mentioned, and it took some legwork, but eventually we found out that this was a description, or this was a discrepancy in male patients versus female patients. So only kidney cancer so far has shown this huge dichotomy between male and female patients in the DNA methylation data, right? Um, but it's not terribly surprising, because if you think about the X chromosome, right? So in females, you know, one of the X chromosomes might be turned off, for instance or some genes might be turned off. Or in males, you know, you have males and females, the sex chromosomes were the first chromosomes that we thought of because they're the ones that biologically distinguish males, males from females. So then what we ended up doing was we removed sex chromosomes from this particular analysis. When we did that, this is what we got. Now, again, you see a dichotomy, but this dichotomy is across batch boundaries. So now you have clear, you know, you have batches 65 and 32 on top, and you have 50, 64, and 69 at the bottom. So when you do this, and all of this was done using the MBATCH software that I, that I described to you before, the R package, this was done using that. So now we see, um, you know, a discrepancy, and now we suspect we see a batch effect. So we went back to USC, the center that generated this data, and there were 27,000 probes that were used. This is 27K platform, so there were 27,000 probes. But uh, we said, okay, we're seeing this effect, you know, do you guys have any comments? Do you know what's going on or what's happening? So they did their own analysis and they came back and they said, well, you know what? We ran replicates, uh, the same samples in multiple batches. And then we looked at the probes. In theory, the probes should have identical values in a perfect world. But in reality, some of the probes had variations. So what they did was they compiled a list uh, that was in sorted order by variation in descending order. So those probes that had the highest variation were on top of the list, and those probes with the lowest variation were at the bottom of the list. So those with low variation would be more trustworthy, I guess, because the replicates were producing more uniform values. So they gave us this list, and out of that list, out of the 27,000 probes, we removed the top 150 variable probes, only 150, a small fraction of the 27K. When we remove those probes with the most variation, then this is the plot that we got. And as you can see, now the batches have merged together. Okay? So the point that I'm trying to make is just 150 probes out of 27,000 are enough to create a serious batch effect like that. Right? So in the analysis, subsequent analysis that was done in kidney cancer, those 150 probes were removed from the analysis. But then when you look at this plot, again you see a dichotomy, you know? And it's like, what the heck is going on with this particular data set? You've got a dichotomy, then another dichotomy, then another dichotomy, right? The first one was legitimate because it was males versus females. So that was legitimate biology. Second one was not. That was a technical bias. And now you have a third one. So this one took quite a while to figure out. 
but the kidney analysis working group, you know, put their heads together and figured out that these samples, now remember this is clear cell kidney cancer, but these samples had molecular profiles similar to chromophobe kidney cancers, even though the histology review said they were clear cell. So if you look under a microscope, they look a lot like clear cells. But if you look at the molecular profiles, they are similar to chromophobes and different from clear cell. So that was very interesting as well. And that illustrates the point that sometimes molecular profiles do not agree with what the clinicians say, uh, you know, according to the microscope. So these samples were then also subsequently removed from the analysis in the kidney cancer paper. But this is a legitimate dichotomy. The, the point that I'm trying to make is that when you see these effects, it's not always, okay, there's a batch effect, let's remove it, let's correct the data. No, sometimes it's legitimate. So you gotta do the legwork, you gotta do the forensics. So that's what, so, this, so these type of analysis can be done using the tools that I mentioned. And hopefully that'll give you an overview of what's available out there. Obviously I don't have time to go through all the tools, but you're welcome to browse through this page, go through these tools and see you know, if you need something and maybe these tools can help you answer them. Okay. So that brings me to the end of this session. Um, we will have an exercise uh, session after this, I guess.